Peer review, print speaking to the blind, celebrating 40 years of audio newspaper production. Welcome to this week's edition of the Herald Scotland podcast, recorded at the Bishop Briggs Media Centre by our amazing volunteers. You can get in touch with us via Facebook, Twitter or Instagram using at Cune Review, that is at symbol C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W. You can also contact us directly by emailing information at tunereview.com. That is I-N-F-O-R-M-A-T-I-O-N at symbol C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W dot C-O-M. Or by calling 0141 772 That's 0141 772 this is from the Herald, Scotland, on Thursday the 30th of November 2023, from the news section. Harbour Energy highlights profitability of North Sea trade. This article is written by Mark Williamson. The North Sea's biggest oil and gas producer has underlined how much money firms are making in the area and revealed that it is eyeing material acquisition opportunities. Harbour Energy said it is in line to generate around $1 billion, that's £0.8 billion, cash from its operations this year, and declared it had continued to maximise the value of its UK oil and gas portfolio in the first nine months. The cash generated by the UK business has been used to fund generous payouts to investors, while leaving Harbour in a position to make bold moves as a wave of consolidation sweeps the sector. Chief Executive Linda Cook said Harbour is evaluating a number of material mergers and acquisition opportunities as directors seek to build a global and diverse oil and gas company. She noted, Recent large transactions in our sector and our own discussions with potential counterparties indicate that market conditions for M&A are improving. The comments follow reports that Harbour is mulling a bid for the Wintershall DEA oil and gas business, which is thought to command a valuation of around $10 billion. A spokesperson for Harbour said it had no comment to make on the reports. Harbour threatened to shift investment overseas, following the introduction of the windfall tax in the UK last year. The company cut 350 jobs in the North Sea business. It snubbed the North Sea Exploration Round, held by the government this year, in support of official efforts to max out the area's reserves. Harbour has operations in Mexico and Indonesia, which Ms Cook said provide diversification opportunities. However, more than 90% of its production comes from the North Sea oil and gas fields. In a trading and operations update issued yesterday, Harbour made clear that the North Sea operation has been trading very profitably, although market conditions are not as favourable as they were last year. Oil and gas prices surged to multi-year highs last year amid Russia's war on Ukraine. They have fallen in the last 12 months as concerns about the outlook for the global economy have mounted. The company said it got an average of $77 per barrel for its UK oil production and 53 pence per therm for gas in the first nine months of this year. Production costs averaged $16 per barrel oil equivalent. Harbour has distributed $440 million to investors in the year to date through dividends and share buybacks. It approved $600 million distributions last year. Shareholders include US private equity firms which backed Harbour to buy big North Sea portfolios during the downturn that started in 2015. It expects to make tax payments totalling $400 million for the current year. In March, Harbour claimed the windfall tax had all but wiped out the profit it made last year. This was after taking account of a $1.5 billion non-cash deferred tax charge in respect of the windfall tax. 
in August, Harbour said it got £22.7 million tax rebates in the first half following refunds of amounts paid in UK in prior years. Harbour noted yesterday that it has made progress in the emerging carbon capture and storage industry in the UK in recent months. The Viking project, which Harbour is leading with BP in the Humber region, passed important development milestones, including the start of front-end engineering and design work. Harbour is a partner in the Acorn project, which will involve storing carbon dioxide beneath the North Sea of Scotland. In July, the Scottish Carbon Cluster Scheme, which ACORN forms part of, won a place on the government's Track 2 programme to support CCS schemes. Analysts at Stiffel Investment Bank said yesterday's update showed that Harbour was performing in line with guidance and should be in a good position to continue to return cash to shareholders in 2024. They added that Miss Cook's positive remark about M&A market conditions suggested the gap between buyers and sellers is decreasing after the commodity price shocks of 2022. In the USA, ExxonMobil last month bought Pioneer Natural Resources for $59.5 billion. Chevron bought Hess for $60 billion. Harbour Energy shares closed up at 5.2p at 223.5p, leaving the company with a stock market capitalisation of around £1.7 billion. The North Sea Transition Authority yesterday welcomed the fact that seven North Sea development projects valued at almost £4 billion have been approved by regulators and investors this year. The bulk of the value is accounted for by the $3.8 billion plan to develop the Rosebank field, which was approved by Equinor and Ithaca Energy in September. That article was written by Mark Williamson. This is from the Herald, Scotland, on Thursday the 30th of November 2023. From the news section. Minimum alcohol price, Scotland. Job Fears Over New Increase This article is written by Gabriel Mackay. Proposals to raise the minimum unit price of alcohol have raised fears among workers in Scotland's drinks industry that jobs in the sector will be put at risk. A minimum price, MUP, of 50p per unit was introduced in 2018 with the Scottish Government proposing that this be raised to 65p. In June, Public Health Scotland released a final evaluation of the policy, which found hundreds of deaths were prevented by the policy, but that there was limited evidence that it reduced consumption among the heaviest drinkers. The report found that increasing the minimum price would both exacerbate the beneficial and harmful effects of the policy, with the latter including evidence that poorer drinkers with alcohol dependency cut back on food as alcohol costs rose. Under the 65p MUP, a 700ml bottle of Scotch whisky would cost a minimum of £18.20, while a bottle of vodka or gin would have a minimum price of £17.07. A pack of four 440ml cans of cider would cost at least £5.15, while a pack of four beer cans of the same size would cost at least £5.72. GMB Scotland, the biggest union in the sector, surveyed members on the Scottish Government's proposal to increase the MUP. Most, 64%, said the MUP should be scrapped entirely, while almost a third, 32%, did not believe it should be increased. The union said minimum unit pricing increased the cost of the cheapest drinks and is already effectively a tax on the poorest Scots. It said an MUP of 65 pence would be 30% higher than when it was introduced, while wages have only increased by £1.14, in the same period when adjusted for inflation. 
The union also highlighted opinion polls, revealing falling public support for minimum unit pricing and official statistics suggesting alcohol-related deaths have increased year on year. One distillery worker told researchers, increasing the minimum unit price will only have a detrimental effect on one of Scotland's success stories. Why is the government intent on penalising a sector that employs thousands of people across the country? Another drinks industry worker taking part in the survey told the union, minimum pricing has not worked. It has only increased the profits of the supermarkets and off-licences that sell alcohol. If the government had not wanted to make a difference, the extra tax should have been used to fund more alcohol awareness centres and treatment facilities. David Hume, GMB Scotland organiser in the drinks industry, said, There is simply no case for continuing to impose a minimum unit price on alcohol, never mind increasing it. The jury is out on the policy's impact on Scotland's drinking, but alcohol-related deaths are rising, and there is no evidence to suggest it is helping protect problem drinkers. The actual impact of minimum pricing is at best questionable, and ministers should be asking those questions instead of doubling down by increasing it. Meanwhile, workers in the drinks industry, our members, report pay being squeezed, and a chill on investment that will risk growth and jobs in one of Scotland's most important sectors. Instead of pursuing policies that undermine this crucial industry, ministers should bolster it with an industrial strategy capable of improving skills and pay and boosting investment. A Scottish Government spokesperson said, Recent expert research estimated that our world-leading minimum unit pricing, MUP, policy has saved hundreds of lives, likely averted hundreds of alcohol-attributable hospital admissions each year, and is having an effect on our most deprived areas. A Public Health Scotland, PHS, report published earlier this year indicated that economic performance of the alcoholic drinks industry in Scotland had not been significantly impacted by the introduction of minimum unit pricing, MUP. We're determined to do all we can to reduce alcohol-related harm and are already working closely with alcohol and drug partnerships and the third sector to reduce alcohol-related harms. Last year, £106 million was made available to alcohol and drugs partnerships to support local and national initiatives to improve treatment. That article was written by Gabriel Mackay. This is from the Herald, Scotland, on Thursday the 30th of November 2023, from the news section. Nova Sea Star. Tidal Energy Plan for Orkney gets EU backing. This article is written by Jodie Harrison. A tidal farm off the coast of Orkney is set to be home to what a company claims is the largest number of turbines anywhere in the world. NOVA, experts in marine renewables, has won European Union EU funding for a 4 megawatt tidal energy farm off the coast of Orkney, which will be called Sea Star. The project will kick-start the manufacture of turbines at the company's headquarters in Edinburgh. It will mark a crucial step in unlocking a new global source of renewable energy in the battle against climate change. First Minister Hamza Youssef visited NOVA earlier this year. He said, Scotland is a world leader in marine renewable energy as a result of consistent and committed support from the Scottish Government together with the expertise, investment and innovation of the industry. NOVA's project at the European Marine Energy Centre, EMEC, in Orkney, will accelerate the development of a new industry and helps to show how Scottish ingenuity is helping us to capture the immense potential of renewable energy from our seas and oceans. NOVA hoped the project will build on the Shetland Tidal Array, the world's first offshore tidal farm, 
which has been powering homes in the archipelago since 2016. Nova say they have enhanced technology and slashed the cost of tidal energy by 40%. The ambitious project is funded by the EU's Horizon Europe programme, which is dedicated to fostering innovation and technology. Simon Forrest, chief executive of Nova Innovation, said, This is a huge win for Nova and a huge vote of confidence for the tidal energy sector. To be awarded the EU's flagship tidal energy project with turbines made and deployed here in Scotland using a pan-European supply chain is testament to our track record of success. The Seastar project will see more turbines installed than all other current deployments worldwide combined. This will enable Nova to start mass manufacturing, deploy at scale and continue to drive down the cost of tidal energy. Nova say tidal energy in the UK could meet 11% of the current electricity demand, while the global market could be worth about £125 billion by 2050. That article was written by Jodie Harrison. This is from the Herald, Scotland, on Thursday the 30th of November 2023, from the News section. Prime Minister's Questions Sunak and Flynn clash over UK Government energy bill support. This article is written by Andrew Learmonth. Rishi Sunak has insisted that his government has provided considerable support for energy bills this year. The Prime Minister was challenged over a lack of help for families in the Commons on Wednesday, with the SNP's Westminster leader, Stephen Flynn, pointing out that while children in his Aberdeen South constituency would have been filled with delight at the snow in the city, their parents would have been filled with dread. Dread, knowing that they simply cannot afford to pay their energy bills, he continued. So in that context, can I ask the Prime Minister, does he regret offering no financial mechanism whatsoever towards families this winter? Mr Sunak said it was simply not right to say there isn't support for families this winter. There's been considerable support this year for energy bills. Mr Flynn then mocked the Prime Minister's considerable wealth. Mr Sunak, a former hedge fund manager, and his wife, Akshata Murti, have an estimated worth of about £529 million. I appreciate it's difficult for the Prime Minister to empathise when he quite clearly can't understand. But to be clear to both him and indeed the whole House, this isn't a matter of energy production. Scotland produces six times more gas than we consume, and only two-thirds of our electricity already comes from renewable resources. This is a consequence of decades of failed energy policy here in Westminster, and those of us on these benches, we believe that Scotland's energy wealth and our energy resource should benefit the people of Scotland. Why doesn't he? Mr Sunak replied, The entire energy grid infrastructure in this country is integrated, which brings benefits to people in every part of our United Kingdom. But when it comes to supporting people with energy bills, that's why earlier this year we increased benefits to the highest rate on record. It's why we've provided a cost-of-living payment worth £900 on top of regular support. And it was right not to wait till the last moment to give people that support. We gave it to them earlier this year, so they would have the security they need going into winter. And, as I said, on top of the money for pensioners, and when there are cold snaps, we have cold weather payments that kick in and the Warm Homes discount providing an extra £150 to the most vulnerable households. All of that is the most considerable action taken by any government to help people with their energy bills. Earlier, the Prime Minister appeared to escalate a diplomatic row with Greece, accusing the country's leader of trying to grandstand over the Elgin marbles. On Tuesday, the Tory leader cancelled a planned meeting with Kyriakos Mitsukakis 
after the Greek leader reiterated his government's long-standing call for the British Museum to return the sculptures taken from the Pantheon in the early 19th century. I mean, it's as if I told you that you would cut the Mona Lisa in half and you would have half of it at the Louvre and half of it at the British Museum. Do you think your viewers would appreciate the beauty of the painting in such a way? He told the BBC's Laura Koonsberg on Sunday. Defending his actions in the Commons, Mr Sunak said, It was clear that the purpose of the meeting was not to discuss substantive issues for the future, but rather to grandstand and relitigate issues of the past. A Prime Minister's questions, Sir Keir Starmer, who met Mr Mitsukakis during his visit to London, accused Mr Sunak of trying to humiliate the Greek Premier. The Labour leader accused the Tory leader of small politics over the row. The Prime Minister told Sakir, Of course we're always happy to discuss important topics of substance with our allies, like tackling illegal migration, or indeed strengthening our security. But when it was clear that the purpose of the meeting was not to discuss substantive issues for the future, but rather to grandstand and relitigate issues of the past, it wasn't appropriate. But furthermore, when specific commitments and specific assurances on that topic were made to this country and then were broken, it may seem alien to him, but my view is that when people make commitments, they should keep them. Sir Keir told MPs, I discussed with the Greek Prime Minister the economy, security, immigration. I also told him we wouldn't change the law regarding the marbles, it's not that difficult, Prime Minister. In response, Mr Sunak said, No one will be surprised that he's backing an EU country over Britain. Just this last week he was asked which song best sums up the Labour Party. What did he come up with? Well, he showed his true colours and chose Ode to Joy, literally the anthem of the European Union, and he will back Brussels over Britain every single time. Sir Keir said, let me get this straight. The Prime Minister is now saying that meeting the Prime Minister of Greece is somehow supporting the EU instead of discussing serious issues. Downing Street later denied Mr Sunak was insulting the leader of a NATO ally to distract from domestic migration figures. The Prime Minister's official spokesman said assurances the UK had sought were not adhered to. Asked why it took until Monday to cancel the planned meeting, if assurances about the topic were apparently broken on Sunday morning, he said, There were discussions on Monday, and then the meeting didn't go ahead. That article was written by Andrew Learmonth. This is from the Herald, Scotland, on Thursday the 30th of November 2023, from the News Section. Scottish Federation of Housing Associations warn of poverty crisis. This article is written by Jody Harrison. People living in social housing are skipping meals and cutting off their electricity supplies to make ends meet in the face of the cost of living crisis. A report by the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations, SFHA, has laid bare the drastic circumstances some Scots face as they struggle with rising bills and inflation. The report's authors have laid the blame for the spiralling situation at the door of the UK government and have called for greater support to be given to the most vulnerable. The SFHA said there should be a social energy tariff offering a discounted energy bills rate to support needy customers and prevent self-disconnection. SFHA Chief Executive Sally Thomas said, It is simply not right that in one of the world's richest economies we have so many people facing the level of need uncovered here. And we have to be clear, this is a direct result of political choices. Housing associations provide safe, warm, affordable homes for life but our members are still seeing tenants struggling. Over 70% of Scotland's social tenants receive some form of social security, so if people cannot feed their families or heat their homes, 
then it's clear that the system is not fit for purpose. Reforming universal credit and introducing a social tariff for energy are measures that the UK government could take now, and as we head into another difficult winter, the need has never been more urgent. They must act now. Tenants say their mental health is being affected. More than a quarter of Scotland's population rent their homes from social landlords. Despite housing association rents being half of those in the private rented sector, most social tenants are on lower incomes and are more susceptible to economic shocks. The report, titled It's Your Life's Opportunities, found that the biggest drivers of deprivation have been the exorbitant costs of food and energy, with more than 95% of tenants saying that they are struggling with the costs of putting food on the table and heating their home. The vast majority, 86%, also said they feel worse off than this time last year. Research shows that more than 60,000 people across Scotland are kept out of poverty because they rent socially. Recent figures reveal that an additional 30,000 people in the private rented sector would be lifted out of poverty entirely were they to rent from a social landlord instead. As well as the severe financial implications the cost of living crisis has had for Scotland's social tenants, the report brought to light the widespread impacts on physical and mental health. Almost nine in ten tenants surveyed found that the crisis had had an adverse impact on their health, with two-thirds of them also saying their mental health had worsened. Nearly one in two tenants admitted to skipping meals, with the majority also cutting back on fruit and vegetables. Those with specialist needs have also been hit hard. Some tenants living with diabetes are unable to afford the food required to manage their condition while others who require specialist medical equipment cannot afford to power their devices. David Linden, SNP MP for Glasgow East, welcomed the report's publication and backed calls for reforms to Social Security. He said, In Parliament I have consistently called for the UK Government to introduce Essentials Guarantee that would provide Social Security claimants with a minimum income, protecting people from not being able to afford essentials like food, household bills and travel costs, as well as continuing to call for the reintroduction of the £400 energy bill rebate, immediate action must be taken to tackle the soaring food prices, similar to policies we currently see being introduced in France. I cannot thank the SFHA enough for taking the time to produce the report and giving a voice to social tenants across Scotland, who are suffering most at the hands of a Westminster-made cost-of-living crisis. The UK government can and must go further to help mitigate the worst effects of the cost-of-living crisis, and I hope that this report reinforces the need for them to act sooner rather than later. The UK Government's Department for Work and Pensions has been contacted for comment. That article was written by Jodie Harrison. From the Herald Scotland, Thursday the 30th of November, in the sports section, Glasgow Warriors star Sintu Manjizi opens up on injury hardship. Article by rugby writer Ewan Booth Robertson. Sintu Manjizi remains fully focused on Glasgow Warriors, but he's already planning for the future and his mum wouldn't allow anything different. The versatile forward has experienced injury issues since joining Glasgow in May 2020, and he returned earlier this month against the Ospreys for his first appearance since last season's 1872 Cup clash over Edinburgh at Murrayfield. The 28-year-old has plenty of rugby left in him, but he's also undergoing an online course after previously studying at Nelson Mandela University in Port Elizabeth, with his mother a major influence. I was studying online in South Africa, Manjese admitted. I am doing a course like a real estate degree, but my main one is an economics degree. I have a year left on that. I have one or two modules left to do, so it is not too bad. Hopefully I can get that done. 
My mum has been on my case about my future, and I do understand the importance of this, as you can't really do this forever, so it has to be something for afterwards you have to prepare for. Born in East London in South Africa, Manjisi was allowed to return to his homeland to spend time with his family during the rehabilitation by Warriors coach Franco Smith. The imposing lock admits it was a soul-searching time in the sidelines, but he was grateful for Glasgow's compassionate support. I was fortunate enough to go back home for a couple of weeks, which was nice, Manjese admitted. They are really understanding if you want an off weekend. Rehab is tough. You are away from the team and isolated, but the environment we have here is one that really brings you in and really gets you involved. It was tough, I won't lie, but the environment here really does allow you to get over the injury and be involved with the team in certain ways. I had a bit of a long-term injury. I am glad to be back and able to contribute to the team. It was my knee, my meniscus that took a turn and I came back, came here at the back end of the season so it was difficult to try and fit in a game with the boys doing so well during the season. It is difficult but I have to take one week at a time and be grateful that I am getting through the games and contribute as best as I can. I am strapped up but no problem with the knee. There's a good atmosphere around Scottsdale currently with Glasgow flying high at the top of the URC table after a superb comeback win over at Ulster last weekend. Glasgow trailed by 14 points after just 12 minutes, but the resilience shone through as they secured a bonus point win to extend their record to 5 wins from 6. We knew the threat Ulster would pose in terms of physicality, and they're a class side, so we knew that we had to front up, Minjese added. Going 14-0 down was not in the game plan, but we needed one of these games where we needed to dig deeper, than we are normally used to. They pounced on their mistakes and we did well to come back from that. A daunting trip to reigning champions Munster awaits Glasgow tomorrow night, but Manjese insists the Warriors were focused on their own performance. He added, They are the defending champions and we know what they bring in terms of physicality and the quality they have in their side. It is a big one for us and the main focus is on what we can do. In that article was by rugby writer, Ewan Booth Robertson. From the Herald Scotland, Thursday the 30th of November, from the sports section, Luke Donald reappointed European Ryder Cup skipper for 2025. Article by golf correspondent Nick Roger. If it ain't broken all that, there are still 22 months until the 2025 Ryder Cup, but, like a prisoner chalking off the days of his sentence in the wall of his cell, the countdown is on. Luke Donald's reappointment as European skipper yesterday, just eight weeks after leading his side to a commanding conquest over the USA and Rome, was hardly an earth-shattering surprise. When the canny, amiable Englishman hosted the Little Gold Chalice aloft on that sun-soaked Sunday at the Marco Simone Club back in October, the hearty serenade of two more years from his jubilant players was a resounding, ringing endorsement. Calm, measured, meticulous, successful, no, not a description of this correspondent as a deadline looms, don't be daft, but the words of Guy Kinnings, the Ryder Cup Executive Director, as he mulled over the bountiful attributes that Donald brought to the table. He'll bring them back again for the return match at Boisterous Bethage Park in New York, as Europe tried to achieve something they haven't done since 2012, win on American soil. Donald's reappointment means the European process for selecting a captain has been hurled out of the window, well, for the time being at least. What we've done is make a decision which is based on the goal of retaining the trophy in 2025. I don't think it should be read anything more than that, added Kinnings of this temporary break from the norm. For a while now in the European setup, there has been a kind of assumed line of succession that you get with our royal family. The emergence of LIV and the subsequent defection to the Saudi backed series of a whole host of players with Ryder Cup captaincy credentials put something of a spanner in the works. The retention of Donald, then, means there will be no hats being tossed into the ring, no lengthy interview process, no interminable, tiresome speculation from us lot in the golf media about who's going to get the job. Donald becomes the first repeat European captain since Bernard Gallagher performed the role in 1991, 1993 and 1995, while he'd be aiming to be the first to mastermind home and away win since Tony Jacklin back in 1985 and 1987. It was an opportunity, 
the former world one number one couldn't turn down. Even when I was lifting the trophy and hearing the guy shout two more years, I thought, I don't really want to let them down. Maybe I have to do this again, said Donald, who had stepped into the role after Henrik Stenson was effectively sacked for joining the LIV. But I still wanted some time to think about it. It's not often in life you're given great opportunities, and this is an amazing opportunity. I love the challenge. I think even in my individual career, I've never really backed away from those challenges. To get to number one in the world for a player of my stature, the way I play the game, wasn't easy, but it gave me a great amount of pride to be able to do that. It's just the same as being captain in 2023. We were up against a strong US team, and we were coming off worse our worst ever loss at Whistling Straits. To figure out a way to give the team a better opportunity for success in Rome was very pleasing. Playing away is a different animal. It's a bigger challenge, but it's something that excites me and that's really the reason why I want to do this. Talking to the players on that Sunday night was the most gratifying thing for me. Just hearing from them, some of the embraces we had and the tears we shared. I think that showed how much of it means how much it means to all of us. There is already fever talk that Tiger Woods could be Donald's opposite number in New York. Tiger himself played down all the hoopla the other day and Donald, who beat Woods in the four balls of that Medina thrill in 2012, remained coy in the mouth-watering prospect. The desire to win, whoever the US captain is, is strong, he said with statesmanlike diplomacy. Obviously, Tiger's been mentioned as a possible candidate, but we'll have to wait and see. We've got a while until crunch time in the Big Apple, but Donald's appointment is an early statement of European intent. Start spreading the news. And that article was by golf correspondent Nick Roger. From the Herald of Scotland. Thursday the 30th of November, from the sports section. WP Nail on his recent top form and possibility of retirement. A report on rugby by Stuart Bathgate, senior sports writer. At 37, WP Nail is well aware that retirement cannot be too far off, but, far from feeling that his powers are waning with the passing years, the Edinburgh tighthead prop believes that he is currently in his best form since the time he made his Scotland debut back in 2015. When some players insist they're in top-notch condition, a measure of scepticism is called for, but when someone is generally self-deprecating as Nail does so, you would be wise to listen. He may have ended up on the losing side in last week's URC match at home to Benetton, but he clearly contributed more than his fair share to a team display that, minus a few moments of madness, should have been enough to give Edinburgh a fifth win from six starts in the league. If I look at last week's performance and take how World Cup pre-season went, yeah, I'm probably in the best shape I've been in the last eight years, Nell said earlier this week. I said to the boys in the gym earlier this week, it's funny how you take so long to sort out my body, to finally find out what I need to do and what I don't need to do. But yeah, I'm happy where I am. It's still awesome to be out there and put a performance out for the team. Having signed for Edinburgh from the Cheetahs in his native South Africa back in 2012, Neil qualified to play for Scotland on residency grounds three years later. If he thought about retiring before now, the chance to play in a third Rugby World Cup surely played a big role in persuading him to stay on for a while longer, and his contributions to the squad in France showed that he thoroughly merited his selection. But, with that tournament out of the way, he faces a big decision over the next few months, as his current Edinburgh contract runs out at the end of the season. It would be no surprise if he were to decide that enough was enough, and yet he is apparently in no rush to make a definitive decision. I'm close to retirement. How close? That I don't know, he insisted. I'm just taking it day by day at the moment. Enjoy it while I'm out here and see what's coming next. That's how I'm planning to do it this season. After that defeat by Benetton, Edmund now faced a difficult trip to Belfast to take on Ulster on Saturday night. While he is satisfied enough with his own form, he still feels that the commitment to the team is more important than taking pleasure in individual excellence. You still need to put the team first. We need to win. That's the frustrating bit. I think last weekend we dominated so much in the game and didn't close the game down. If Edinburgh to avoid a second straight defeat, or, to frame it in a more positive way, 
if they are to make it five wins from seven matches. Much will depend on Nell's duel with Stephen Kitschoff. The Springboks World Cup winning loose head made a debut off the bench in Ulster's defeat by Glasgow last Saturday and is now likely to make his first start this weekend. He's a good scrummager, he's a good player, he's a good guy. Nell said of an opponent with whom he has regularly crossed swords with over the years. That's why we play the game. We want to play against the best and it's going to be a good test this weekend. Nell is used more sparingly by his club and at test level these days, but Edinburgh coach Sean Everett is in no doubt of his abiding value. WP has been amazing, he said. He's got four young children at home so he's busy there, but he comes in and trains like a youngster. Then you look at this performance on Friday night and you wonder when it's all going to come to an end because it's almost like he's getting better. That's one of the better performances I've seen from a tight head prop this year, so he's on top of his game at the moment. And that report was by Stuart Bathgate. From the Herald Scotland, Friday the 1st of December, from the news section, Free Hogmanay Night Bus Travel in Glasgow from First Bus, article by Kationa Stewart. Glasgow's night bus service providers have confirmed services, which narrowly avoided being axed earlier this year, will run in Hogmanay to take revellers home. One company, First Bus, has announced free travel in all four of its Glasgow night bus services on December the 31st into January the 1st. The city's largest bus operator runs four night bus routes between 12.45am and 3am on Friday and Saturday nights and has confirmed free travel will be offered across its N2, N18, N240 and N267 at those times in the early hours of January 1st, 2024. The four routes running across the city will take people home to Easter House, East Kilbride, Clenelland and Hamilton. Graham McFarlane, Commercial Director for First Bus Scotland, said, Hogmanay is one of the biggest celebratory event nights of the year and we are delighted to offer free travel on our night bus services across Glasgow in the early hours of January the 1st to help people get home safely while not having to worry about putting their hand in their pocket. Meanwhile, McGill's has also announced its Glasgow night bus network will run in Hogmanay. The night buses which usually run on Friday and Saturday nights, will operate on Sunday, December the 31st, every hour until 3.45am on January the 1st. The five routes run across the city to keep people home to Paisley, Pollock, Knits Hill, Newton Mearns and Drumchapel. McGill's Glasgow Night Bus Network launched in August after the company, owned by James and Sandy Easdale, stepped in after they were withdrawn by first bus. Now McGill's will bring this service to New Year revellers who will be celebrating in Glasgow. Alex Hornby, Group Managing Director, said, Since we launched our Glasgow Night Bus Network earlier in the year, one of the first in the UK to run completely with zero emission electric buses, we've received a great welcome from those in the nighttime leisure sector across Glasgow and our growing numbers of customers who have come to trust a safe and reliable way to travel after midnight. We are delighted to now extend coverage further by helping people celebrate and get them home after bringing in the bells in Hogmanay. Not only will this help customers out celebrating, but it will also support hospitality workers to get home safely after a very busy shift. And that article was back by Kationa Stewart. From the Herald Scotland, Friday the 1st of December. From the news section, Glasgow pubs. Offer sought for the Park Bar in Finiston. Article by Ian McConnell. The chance to run one of Glasgow's best-known bars has been hailed as a great business opportunity. Graham and Seabold is inviting offers of £75,000 per annum for the leasehold interest in the Park Bar in Glasgow's West End, with an ingoing premium of £225,000 sought. The property agent said... The Park Bar is a well-known establishment in the ever-popular West End of Glasgow. The pub is an institution serving the truthy residents of Glasgow, tourists and the wider Gaelic community. This pub is a true gem offering a charming turnkey operation, benefiting from a healthy balance of tourist trade mixed with local clientele. 
It observed that the pub was well known in Glasgow and beyond, adding that it offered an excellent range of drinks and the capacity to supply a hearty pub grub. Current leaseholder Nina Steele said, It's been a privilege to run the park bar over the last 30 odd years. The park plays a special role not only in the local community, but also within Gildom and with followers of traditional Cayley music. Thank you to all our fantastic customers. We have made many friends from all over the world. Martin Sutherland, licensed trade and business agent with Graham and Sybil, said, We are delighted to be marketing the Park Bar in Glasgow. This pub is an institution in the West End that already has an established reputation and client base. Graham and Sybil said, The pub offers a great business opportunity for the right tenant to make the most of the large footfall in the hustle and bustle of Finiston. The pub offers a large open plan bar, seating area on the ground floor, with a warm welcoming atmosphere, a wraparound bar and a fully fitted commercial kitchen. The pub seamlessly blends traditional features with modern fixtures and fittings, making it attractive to a wide range of customers. And that article was by Ian McConnell. From the Herald Scotland, Friday the 1st of December 2023, from the news section. John Byrne, acclaimed playwright and artist, dies aged 83. Article written by Gabriel Mackay. Acclaimed playwright and artist John Byrne has died at the age of 83. The Paisley born auteur, who was trained at the Glasgow School of Art, died peacefully yesterday with his wife Janina by his side, the Fine Art Society said in a statement. Byrne was best known for his Slab Boys trilogy, which tells the story of a group of young, urban working class Scots during the period 1957 to 1972. Based partly on his own life, the Slab Boys premiered at the Traverse Theatre on the 6th of April 1978, following Cut in a Rug the following year and Still Life in 1982. Byrne was also a prolific artist, designing jackets for Penguin Books from 1964 to 1966. He became a professional painter in 1968 and became well known for his self-portraits as well as designing record covers for Donovan, The Beatles, Jerry Rafferty and Billy Connolly. His work is held in the Scottish National Portrait Gallery, the Museum of Modern Art and the Kelvin Grove Art Gallery. Byrne also created the TV dramas Tutti Frutti and Your Cheating Heart, the former winning him a BAFTA in 1987. His family have requested privacy. In an article written by Gabriel Mackay. From the Herald Scotland, Monday the 4th of December, from the news section, Kevin McKenna interview, Gender Recognition Reform, How MPM Fought Scottish Government's Plan, article by Kevin McKenna. The three experts providing intellectual rigour for women's sex-based rights are meeting me in the basement flat of an Edinburgh suburb. I can't be more specific than this because they've previously been subject to unwelcome attention for challenging the Scottish Government on this issue. I can safely say this is one of the city's leafier suburbs because, well, that could apply to any of about 50 neighbourhoods in Edinburgh. Dr Kath Murray Dr. Lisa Hunter Blackburn and Lisa McKenzie are collectively known as MBM. The Academic and Research Collective which, in the course of the last five years, has effectively scrutinised and dismantled the Scottish Government's rationale for permitting men to identify as women in its GRR legislation. They make an unlikely rebel alliance. Two of them, Hunter Blackburn and McKenzie, have worked at various levels within the Scottish and UK governments in the threshing rooms where policy gets sculpted into something workable and legally waterproof. Murray is a highly respected criminologist and, and academic. Most of their work is now with MBM, having discovered that being out and proud as feminists was becoming bad for the health of their careers and, in some quarters, their reputations. They share a common interest in criminal justice and, in particular, how the system can exclude and entrap society's most vulnerable and marginalised women. In the five years since MBM was established, one consequence of the debate around self-ID 
and women's protected spaces has become clear to them? Says Hunter Blackburn, Some of the women's groups who have found common cause in opposing self-ID were campaigning for women's rights in the 1960s and 1970s and can't believe they're now back to where they started. Could they have seen back in 2018 what they were getting themselves into? Absolutely not, says Mackenzie. To begin with, we had concerns over the census bill and what the self-ID might portend for women. We began pulling a thread and it just kept on coming. Very soon we realised it was almost endless. One of these threads began to expose the implications of self-ID for women's prisons. They wrote up what they were finding and, as Dr Money described it, being very old-fashioned about it. We put in FOI request and wrote an article for, for Scottish Affairs. The more we looked at it, the more we sensed something was going badly off the rails here. The census took us into data collection. The police, criminal justice. We were seeing how various organisations and public authorities were changing their collection practices. Mackenzie added, I first looked at the Scottish Prisons Policy, which has come into place in 2014, two years after the Angeli- Angiolini report. This was concerned with the vulnerability of women in prison, the sort of people they were, their trauma and how so many of them were victims of male violence. Then, two years later, Scottish Prisons Policy basically says that if a male prisoner says he's a woman, you should presume to move him to the women's estate. Unbelievably, there was nothing in the Equality Impact Assessment dealing with women prisoners. When I requested a Freedom of Information request in 2018, it revealed the approach to Scottish Trans Alliance and Stonewall. And though they listed the protected characteristics in the Equality Act, they hadn't even even bothered to tick six sex. What was beginning to unfold before their eyes was a textbook formula for security capturing policy and working against the interests of vulnerable women before being diverted right under the nose of an unsuspecting population. So that, by the time it's inevitably discovered, it becomes so embedded in the system that any attempts to scrutinise it are met by hills of ridicule and mis accusations of bigotry, mainly by men. She added, There was no consideration about the potential impact of this on female prisoners or female prison officers who would now be forced to do intimate body searches on people who were male. How did this happen? At that point, the debate began to kick off at UK level, but getting it into the press was very hard work. The Scottish Government had started the consultation on GRA, but was ignoring all the implications of it for women, saying it was merely a technical fix. Dr Hunter Blackburn, the former senior government policy maker, said, It didn't have enough quality for a government product. Lots of stuff was undefined and they were merely skating around other issues. I suggest that there seemed to be a sinister aspect to much of this, that it had the flavour of something cooking for many years prior to insinuating itself clandestinely into national policy frameworks. They picked their words carefully here and they're reluctant to describe it as sinister, but agree that dismantling women's sex-based rights was part of the strategy that had been unfolding over decades. Said Dr Hunter Blackburn, We had a group of people who were very convinced that what you felt yourself was to be more important than anything else. They were in active politics for decades. If you look at the Equality Network here, it was set up from the very start on gender identity. It's not an add-on, unlike Stonewall, which changed course. Of course, there was a job of work to do around gay rights, because the culture in Scotland on this was lagging but gender identity over sex was becoming baked into this. In 2007, the Yogyakarta Principles sought to codify human rights in the area of gender identity. It's since been portrayed as an international treaty and used used as such by powerful lobbying groups seeking to influence governments. It's not a treaty, she added. It arose from a gathering of very determined and well-organised lobbyists in an Indonesian hotel. Their own admitted technique was to proceed under the radar and through the back door. All other policies on minority rights, such as gay rights, have come openly through the front door. But this had to come round the back and away from plain sight. Dr Murray, whose work as a criminologist has explored issues around the marginalisation of vulnerable groups in the justice system, points out they were quite open about their strategy. They knew that if they could implement these policies in prisons, we'd soon be able to roll them out 
into our hospitals and, sc- and our schools and our sports organisations. What's chilling is that we an entire political class has embraced this, even when, when presented with hard facts that would compel any reasonable person to urge caution. In the years to come, Kath Murray, Lucy Hunter Blackburn, Bun and Lisa McKenzie would discover that the ordinary women raising concerns about this would have doors shut in their faces. Many politicians treated these women, who were their constituents, with contempt. And that article was written by Kevin McKenna. From the Herald, Monday, 4th of December, 2023. Sports section. Ref made very bad decision, but we should have killed the game. Bernardo Silva. Article by Martin McMillan. Bernardo Silva feels Manchester City suffered a very, very bad decision against Tottenham, but admits the team also need to do their own job better. City's players, and particularly Erling Haaland, reacted furiously when they were denied the chance to play advantage in the closing moments of a thrilling 3-3 draw on Sunday after the Norwegian striker had been fouled. Haaland had shrugged off this challenge from Emerson Royale, to play Jack Grealish through on goal, but referee Simon Hooper pulled play back to award the host of the Etihad Stadium a free kick. Haaland continued to voice his anger as he left the field after the final whistle, and he later went even further by posting a remark criticising Hooper on social media. Teammate Silva was less emotional in his verdict. It is a bad decision and everyone saw it, said the Portuguese midfielder, but at the end, we're all human. The referee probably is the first one to know it was a very, very bad decision because Grealish was on a one-on-one with the keeper and he could have given us to three points. It's a tough one to take, but in the end it is what it is, football, and sometimes people make mistakes. City, however, also had themselves to blame. After spurning a hat full of chances to claim what could have been a comfortable victory with Howland among the guilty parties. City led 2-1 at the break thanks to a Phil Foden goal after Son Heung-Ming had scored at both ends in the opening nine minutes. Jeremy Ducou and Julian Alvarez also hit the woodwork in the first half when Haaland missed an open goal and one of numerous Spurs errors. Spurs res- recovered to level through Giovanni Lo Celso, but it seemed Grealish had won it in the 81st minute only for Dejan Kutsevitsky to equalise the game in the 90th minute. It was City's third successive draw and saw them slip the third in the Premier League. Silva said we've been conceding late goals against Arsenal, Chelsea, Liverpool and now Tottenham. And in the end, it is seven points. We could be four points ahead on top of the league if we did our job properly, which is to kill the game, or at least don't concede in the last minute. At this level, those little details really matter. We need to demand more from ourselves, each one of us, Spurs late equaliser ended their run of three successive defeats. Kulevsky, who powered in the crucial goal off his shoulder, revealed the visitor's stronger second half showing came after some stern words from manager Ange Postacoglu during the break. The Sweden International told the club's website, the coach was very angry at half-time. It was the first time I've seen him like that, but he did the right thing. What we did was special in the second half. It's an unbelievable feeling. Those moments in life are small. We have to enjoy them and just be thankful and be proud of the team. That article was by Martin McMillan. From the Herald Scotland, Monday the 4th of December, from the business section, business briefing, Plan to transform old open cast mine into tourist destination by Brian Donnelly, business correspondent. Plans are underway to transform a former open cast mine into a tourism and leisure facility. The aim of the site is to promote health and wellness within a sustainable ecology park, providing places for relaxation and rejuvenation, whilst at the same time providing local economic benefits through leisure, entertainment and tourism. Proposals to develop an environmentally sensitive mixed-use co- mixed eco-wellness and leisure park at the site of the for- former St Ninian's open-cast mine next to Kelty and King Seat and Fife 
are being progressed by the developers National Pride, St Ninians Limited. Irene Bissett, Chair of National Pride CIC and Director of National Pride St Ninians Limited said, We are very excited about the enormous potential of this astonishing site. As custodians, we take our responsibilities very seriously and our aim is to deliver an attractive, welcoming place for all. Education and training opportunities, especially for vulnerable adults, will be included and the project will create significant employment, supporting local businesses in the supply chain. National Pride St Ninians Limited is required to undertake pre-application consultation because of its scale, starting with the submission of a Proposal of Application Notice, PEN. This notifies Fife Council that it will be bringing forward an application for planning permission in principle, PPIP, anticipated to take place by the end of the first quarter of 2024, following a minimum 12-week period of community consultation. PPIP aims to establish the principle of development of the site and will be supported by a master plan outlining how the St Ninians and Loch Fitty area will be enhanced. Prior to the application submission, two public consultations will be held locally, inviting comments on the proposals. The first public consultation will be a high-level overview of the proposed development, with the second public consultation bringing forward responses gained from the first public consultation comments. These will be held at Kingsley Community Centre on Thursday, February the 8th, and on Thursday, March the 7th at Kelty Community Centre, respectively, both between 3.30pm and 7.30pm. A project website has been created at www.stninianswellness.com and will be updated over the course of the consultation period. Historic Bookshop to close after 144 years A historic bookshop in a Scots town is to close its doors for good. g and Innes Limited has been selling newspapers and magazines, art supplies, books, gifts and maps for generations at its premises in St Andrews for over 140 years. Also known as The Citizen Shop, g and Innes Limited is the oldest independently run bookshop in the Fife town. Stuart P.M. McIntosh, Central Bank should, Bank should get back to basics. Central banks and governments across the advanced economies from, Amer- from America to the European Union, to Japan, to the United Kingdom, continue to grapple with the post-pandemic supply chain and energy price-driven inflationary spike that is impoverishing poorer citizens, straining public and private budgets and stressing societies. As central banks hike interest rates, not seen in decades. Is it fair and appropriate to ask? What were the policy mistakes that contributed to the current painful inflationary period? And that was today's business briefing by Brian Donnelly. From the Herald Scotland, Friday the 1st of December 2023, from the Arts and Entertainment section, John Byrne Obituary, Artist Leaves Outstanding Legacy, article by Brian Beacom. John Byrne may have been born in the year when Churchill became wartime Prime Minister, but in almost every aspect of his personality, he screamed it out to younger generations a personal mantra, Be yourself, be different. The iconoclast who preached and practiced unrestrained possibility and was born into a tenement building in a less than salubrious corner of Paisley, he was always his own man, always defiant. From his school years as a pupil at St Mirren's Academy, he stood out, the possessor of a defiant yet comedic voice and a slight eccentric who would write spoof anecdotes of stories in the local papers and proved to be quite brilliant with watercolour drawings. This individualistic bent revealed itself through his years at art school and into his working life as a designer at Stoddard's Carpet Factory, where Byrne proved to be a character as colourful as the palettes he worked with. What marked John Byrne out was a way of seeing life around him in terms of bright colours and sometimes dark shades. 
it's a way of thinking that saw him refuse to attach a label to himself. It appears in the symbolism of his clothing. He may have grown up in Fergusley Park, once considered the most depressed housing scheme in Europe, but Burma was always noticeable. He determined to raise eyebrows, this tweedy sooty brogue wearer with the loose silk scarf around his next laughably offered hints of country gent or eccentric rock star, yet matched his presentation up with the insouciant roll-up that seemed to be surgically grafted to his lips as a reminder of his working class roots. Burns certainly never saw his professional life as being singularly focused. He was always a polymath. His carpet factory experiences gave him the colour with which to write a series of plays, beginning with the Slab Boys. It was a work so powerful it transcended not only its Renfrewshire roots, but Scotland, played out in Broadway by young bucks of the day such as Sean Penn and Kevin Bacon. John Burns' artwork, artwork too couldn't fail to grab the nation's attention by the throat, evidencing his album cover work with his old pal from Underwood Lane, Jerry Rafferty. Burns' art was deemed to be striking, amusing and populist and there was little surprise when Billy Connolly asked his friends to design his stage outfits. Yet, such outrageous talent seldom arrives unaccompanied and ego, or innate sense of knowing one's own mind, continually travelled in Burns' personal luggage. Actors found his stage plays to be brilliant and clever but his demands incredibly prescriptive. The late Freddie Bordley once tried to introduce a bit of acting business to his slab boy role. His character entered a church, dicked his comb in the font and ran through his hair, and it was a laugh's guarantee. But John Byrne didn't smile at all. And Bordley couldn't for the life of him work out why Byrne was insistent that his character couldn't, when slapped, say, Aya, as opposed to Ouya. Alex Norton who worked with Byrne back in the 70s on his 1977 play Writer's Cramp and found the writer to be a nightmare. There's not arguing, however, that John Byrne's fastidiousness or his passion for his work helped him produce theatre masterpieces such as a bioplay of Scots painters Calhoun and McBride. He would work from early mornings every day in his garden studio to create his artwork or batter away at an old typewriter to create his plays. It was his great insistence on character detail, or the perfect casting, or exactly the right set that would ensure that TV comedy dramas such as Tutti Frutti and Your Cheating Heart would go on to be adored by the watching public. John Byrne's unconventionality, his uncontained imagination was certainly part of his life as a major success story in art, writing and design. It also featured in his personal life, be married to actor Tilda Swinton while accepting an openness of relationship others would have walked away from. Most people too would most likely have been emotionally destroyed to discover that their father was in fact her grandfather, not John Byrne. He managed not only to accept the truth but to embrace it, considering that it marked him out to be special. There's little doubt John Byrne was a compelling character. He was an example of what could could be possible. He wrote more than 30 plays and screenplays. He illustrated that age needed not deny ambition and his last play, Underwood Lane, ran in Scotland to massive audience appreciation. He said one of the greatest loves of his life was to use language, to play with words and make them sound better. But there was so much more to the man's success. He loved to laugh at pretension. He may have looked like a 19th century dandy, but that wasn't about trying to be pseudo-aristocratic. It was about laughing at the need to look like everyone else of that moment. And he was bold. To land his first art exhibition in London, the young artist sent examples of his work to a gallery, claiming to be his father, Patrick. It worked. The legacy John Byrne leaves is quite outstanding. And it's not simply his body of work. He reminds us of the importance of endeavour, the ritual of commitment that can be so rewarding, and he underlines the belief that there are no limitations to what can be achieved. Most importantly, while his paintings and writings connected with us, he simply he didn't simply reflect our world back at us. John Byrne asked us to ask questions. He asked us to think, and we can't thank him enough for that. 
And that article was by Brian Beacom. This is from the Herald Scotland of Tuesday the 5th of December 2023 and is an opinion piece from the business section. The BBC is now a threat to all local newspapers. If the BBC was a family and lived in the house next door to you, it would be the neighbour from hell. That's the verdict of some of the most experienced local newspaper editors in the country who now regard the BBC as little more than a state-funded juggernaut on course to suffocate independent journalism in every city, town and village in the UK. The BBC seems to be on a mission to be the only show in town, having taken an axe to its much-loved local radio stations so it can start writing news stories online, which you can already get from local newspapers, which are currently battling with tech platforms like Google, Meta and Apple. Unlike Google, Meta and Co., the BBC's funding is guaranteed by the licence fee, meaning the British public is underwriting the biggest threat local journalism has ever faced. It is splashing your cash on local news websites and making it increasingly difficult for proud independent news sites to survive in the long term. How is it doing this? Back in October 2022, the BBC laid out plans to strengthen local online news provision in communities across England. The scheme includes the creation of 130 additional posts. More journalism would normally be welcomed, but the BBC's plans put at risk thousands of existing jobs on titles known to their communities for generations. The BBC says the plans will deliver a stronger and more distinctive local online news service for 43 different local areas in England, all available on the BBC News website and app. What it fails to adequately resolve is the impact this will undoubtedly have on the diverse but fragile independent news sector in each community. It is our reporters who hold local decision-makers to account. Campaign on your behalf. Research and share essential information. Hold up the mirror to local successes and have no other interest than telling the truth. We're also the turn-to source for the BBC when it wants to know what's going on. Most local reporters share their stories and videos with readers through the opaque algorithms of the giant global tech companies like Facebook and Google. As the BBC carries no advertising and is entirely free to read, its stories tend to be prioritised by the big search engines over our journalism. At the same time, the BBC uses its vast monopolistic strength to promote its content, so it has a huge anti-competitive advantage. While independent local journalism is regulated by the tough Independent Press Standards Organisation. The BBC is watched over by Ofcom, which seems largely indifferent to the harm it is causing. Editors are convinced that as they juggle the realities of the cost of living crisis, the BBC, immune from the same commercial pressures, is fixated on stealing their readers, their businesses and the jobs of their journalists. It either knows what it is doing and doesn't care, or is ignorant to the impact it will have. What a shameful legacy that would be for Tim Davy, the 17th Director General of the BBC. If the BBC wants to fairly compete and support a diverse and trusted local news reporting ecosystem, as it claims to do, it must act now. It should focus its efforts on providing a snapshot of life in its 12 English regions, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, and abandon its rollout of 34 local websites, which directly compete with publishers who have cared about local news online during the last decade, when the Beeb repeatedly showed it didn't. It could do so much more to link to local publishers, helping them to, pr- to thrive, rather than trying to close them down. Even such a simple act 
repeatedly asked for over the years, seems beyond the BBC. The government is taking welcome steps to tackle the market abuses by Meta and Google through the Digital Markets Bill, which will create a level playing field between publishers and tech platforms. Yet the BBC will remain as an equally potent threat, all but unchecked by Ofcom. Earlier this year, we called on the BBC to be a better neighbour. It is time the BBC showed that it is not the biggest threat to local community independent journalism, but a global broadcaster focused on delivering the very best television and radio in line with its charter. That was an opinion piece authored by several editors. This is from the Herald Scotland of Tuesday the 5th of December 2023 from the Voices section. Establishment's interests safe in the hands of Labour and SNP. This article is by Kevin McKenna. There is a view prevalent in some sections of the wider Yes movement that MI5 spooks have been active within the SNP for many years. It explains, they say, several unanswered questions still swirling around the downfall of Alex Salmond. It also underpins suspicions about the glacial progress towards independence in the Nicola sturgeon Humza Yousaf era. Some have pinpointed a trip to Washington in 2016 made by several high-ranking SNP figures and prominent journalists, all of it paid for by the U.S. government. What's not mentioned in this narrative is that such junkets are commonplace across Western Europe involving similar actors. They're simply the means by which the U.S. can make some connections which might prove useful down the line. They call it the puppet factory. Personally, I wouldn't be anywhere near them, but then I'm far more likely to receive an invitation to the Scottish Greens Christmas paintball party than to be summoned to partake of the largesse of the American State Department. The theory that British spies have been operating within the SNP isn't as far-fetched as some have insisted. It's now known, largely through the research of Seamus Milne from his book for his book, the enemy within, that MI5 had successfully infiltrated the higher offices of the National Union of Mine Workers during the 1984-85 miners' strike. In the minds of some, it also acts as a convenient explanation for the fact that the prospect of independence is now more or less finished in the current generation. Certainly, when you consider some of the abject failures and, let's be kind here, eccentric choices made by Nicola Sturgeon and Humza Yousaf in filling senior cabinet posts, you could be forgiven for thinking that some insidious, shape-shifting force has been at work. My lord, I now cite Lorna Slater and Patrick Harvey as exhibits A and B in the prosecution bundle. And why would any serious political party claiming to be acting in the best interests of independence devote so much time and energy to demolishing the reputations and character of Joanna Cherry and Kate Forbes, its two smartest, sharpest and most formidable advocates, while preferring a cast of political Teletubbies over them? And why did the leadership seem so keen to intimidate and marginalise those voices within the Yes movement who were advocating for a Plan B at a time when it might have had some leverage? The belief that men can become women on a whim and that male rapists should be housed in women's prisons has revealed the SNP to be a danger to the nation's health. Meanwhile, It can't run an effective ferry service in the highlands and islands, and NASA will have established a branch office on Mars before any new ferries will be completed. If I was Director General of MI5, I'd have deployed exactly the same strategy. Isolate those who might pose a threat to the Union, 
promote Ken Dodd and his Diddy men, adopt policies with which the vast majority of Scots disagree, and then gaslight them all by condemning them as knuckle-draggers. Job done. I've absolutely no doubt that MI5 will have been busy before and during the 2014 independence referendum. It would have been failing in its primary task if it hadn't been. The SNP was beginning to pose a threat to the British state and its global prestige greater than anything since the beginning of the Second World War. But I have equally no doubt that the concept of MI5 sleepers within the ranks of the SNP belongs in the realm of fantasy. As soon as it became clear sometime around 2011 that the SNP was offering rewarding career and remuneration prospects, any British spooks would have been trampled in the stampede of the third rate, Tammany Hall grifters eager to jump aboard the gravy train. Why interrupt the enemy when it's busy scoring own goals? They need only have glanced at the political gargoyles feeding from the SNP trough at Westminster. Nothing to fear. The coast is clear. Revert to DEFCON 5. You begin to wonder, though, if the assorted British intelligence agencies might instead have been beavering away inside the UK Labour Party. If so, then someone at the circus is in line for a serious Christmas bonus. I have long entertained the theory of a Harry Potter-style sorting hat being present at Oxford University's Bullingdon Club or those other custard and suspenders associations beloved of the English aristocracy and their acolytes. In this way, and in order to maintain the chimera of social democracy, some of the chaps will be tasked with making the supreme sacrifice by gaining favour in the Labour Party and rising to high office with the help of the five families who own the London Press and the BBC's editorial suite. Thus they can keep an eye on any nefarious activity that might undermine the social order when the chips are down, the balloon goes up and the lights go out. Every 15 years or so, Labour must be permitted to win to allay any suspicions of foul play. The trick is to ensure that when we do allow them back in, they are safe in the hands of someone who knows where the real money and power lie. They can also provide early warning when things threaten to spin out of control, as happened momentarily after the elevation of Jeremy Corbyn, which mon monetarily threatened a social apocalypse, undermining NATO, attacking the banking cartels, and telling the truth about their puppets in the EU. Of course, they hadn't reckoned with the late Queen Elizabeth becoming so enamoured with Harold Wilson's Couthy charm, else they'd have done the same to him. The procession of Sir Keir Starmer into 10 Downing Street must have been beyond their dampest dreams of avarice. By Jove, this chap has taken it all to the next level. We don't even need to maintain the pretense. The leader of the Labour Party is now opening, saluting, openly saluting Margaret Thatcher. And just to complete the ermine revolution in the People's Party, he is saying he won't be turning on the spending taps. The Conservatives can now take a long, well-earned breather from running the country, safe in the knowledge that it's steady as she goes in the shires, and no one needs to worry about the truculent Scots any more. The oil, the taxes and the soldiery will keep flowing in for a while yet. Three cheers for Sir Keir, and three cheers for Miss Sturgeon and Mr. Yusuf. Isn't life just grand? Brandies, anyone? This is from the Herald Scotland of Tuesday the 5th of December 2023 from the business section. 
spa store in Scottish Village celebrates 65 years in business. This article is by Craig Williams. A spa convenience store in a Scottish village is celebrating a milestone 65 years in business. Susan Hutchison's family have operated the store in Scone in Perth and Kinross since 1958. Susan's father, Ernie, first started the business, with Susan working for him until he retired in 2005. She has been running it ever since, with her son, Ryan, joining in 2013. The store, located on Abbey Road in Scone, is one of the longest-running spa stores in Scotland. To mark the 65th anniversary of the store, which has stood on the same site for over six decades, local customers enjoyed a celebration day, complete with balloons, photography, samples and prizes. Colin McLean, CEO of Spa Scotland, said, We wish Susan and everyone at Spa Abbey Road in Scone every success for the future. 65 years trading is an impressive achievement, especially with what retail businesses have had to contend with in recent years. We look forward to working with Susan and Ryan well into the future as they continue to offer a wonderful convenient service to the local community of Skuen. That article was by Craig Williams. That concludes this week's edition of the Herald Scotland podcast. Please remember to subscribe to our channels at Team Review and tell your friends about our service.